In 1 Thessalonians, we're only going to look at two verses today. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse number uh, 14 and 15, the Bible says, Brothers and sisters, we urge you to warn those who are lazy. Encourage those who are timid and take tender, tender care of those who are weak. But with all three of them, be patient with them. Be patient with everyone. See that you don't treat others the way they treated you. In that process, you don't pay evil for evil, but always try to do good to each other until or unto all people. Watch those who are lazy, watch those who are tender, and take good care of those who are weak. This morning I want to preach on the subject, check yourself. Check yourself. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for giving us these words of encouragement, these words of direction, these words of exhortation to know Thus says the Lord to allow us to see ourselves. God, help us in the process of us seeing ourselves that we do not allow our own personal walk to interfere with the purpose you have for our lives. You are a mighty good Savior. And in the process of being a mighty good Savior, you have taught us what we should do because we have spent many years and days trying to suggest to others what we have not implemented ourselves. So God, help us right now that we check ourselves, that we might see ourselves in one of these characteristics. But dear God, help us to be better, help us to do better on this day because we serve a mighty good Savior. Please forgive us of our sins. In your son's name we do pray and all who believe said amen. Please be seated with me. Um, every Sunday, every Sunday, you will notice there are individuals who are quarterbacks for football teams. And, and on Friday nights, because I boycotted Sunday mornings, um, I watch a lot of Saturday stuff. And now, unlike when I was growing up, you can even watch high school football. Um, in every situation, it is amazing that the quarterback of each team always leaves the field and goes down or goes over to the sideline and he'll put on a headset to speak to somebody. Have y'all ever seen that before? He'll put on a headset and he can talk to them. Years ago, it used to be a phone. They would put a phone uh, up to their ear. Now they even have tablets where they can see the scene of what just happened. The reason they do this is because they are talking to someone who is sitting up higher than them, who has a different perspective than they have on the field. That there is a perspective that shows something that you cannot see with the natural eye, but you can see with the spiritual eye if you elevate yourself to look back at yourself and you, in seeing it from a different perspective, many times you can see what you're missing. Especially because you only have the viewpoint of your viewpoint. And when you only take your viewpoint on anything, you miss open opportunities when you only look at it from the perspective of just you, yourself, and your eye. Okay, let me give it to you again. If you never have anyone who gives you suggestions from a exalted perspective, you will always come out the huddle with the same play. 
without any adjustments to the play because when we're looking at our scene, our personal scene, from a human perspective, we only see it from the limitations of those who can only get a bird's eye view of what you have already seen. But that's why the Apostle Paul says, uh, 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 put your trust or shoot for the mark of the high calling, which is in Christ Jesus, because when you get his perspective on things, you might can see yourself better, improve yourself in a better way, because when you're striving for Christ instead of striving to beat man, you always have work to do. The only time you'll stop having to work on yourself is when you don't have to carry yourself in the church. The only time you will be at your most perfective state is when you can't make any more mistakes. When is that, Pastor? Is that death? So that says to do in examples, and we made the illustration last week that if you are in your house and you have kids, you are a leader. If you work with public people, you are a leader. And you are leading people either up or down by the way you live your life. Paul says, not only in this leadership model, in verses 12 and 13, he also says that maybe many of us struggle in our lives because we fall into three different categories. He is exposing the church at Thessalonica while in turn exposing old gardens. He says there are people in the body of Christ and in the world who are either lazy, timid, or weak. These words lazy, timid, or weak are not used like we use the word lazy, timid, or weak. It has a more spiritual development because it suggests that all of us find ourselves in one or maybe two of these categories that we have to work on. First of all, the Apostle Paul says that many of you in verse number 14 are lazy. He uses this word in the New Living Translation version, but actually he uses the word lazy in our English version, but in their version, in the Greek, it would have been a careless individual. This careless individual is an individual who is rebellious to any form of structure because they have not been able to tame themselves to fit into any format that betters themselves. Okay, let me give it to you again. If you never can receive instructions for your betterment, you are considered lazy, careless, or rebellious. Okay, let me give it to you another. If there is a problem with verses 12 and 13 that you can't work under leadership, it might be because you are trying to be what you have not grown to be. If, if you struggle in any format of working a format out that has already been set until you get the opportunity to create a new format, then it's very dangerous for you in the spiritual life to sit under leadership because you try to be what God has yet to prepare you to be. Let me give it to you a different way. Paul uses the word careless lazy as saying some of us in the body of Christ act like teenagers. Okay. What do you mean, Pastor? He uses the idea that teenagers always know better than the parents but have not used the experience that life has trained them to be. Who in here at the age of 14, 15, 16 did not think that your parents were silly? Y'all going to sit there, only me and Sister Brandon? The rest of y'all were the ones that got kicked out. Let me try it again. Who in here at the age of 16, 17 didn't think that they were silly, ignorant, didn't know what they were talking about, they were old, dated, they were misguided, anybody in here that didn't. And then when you got kids, you put in the same ad because what worked for you ought to work for us. 
that some of us never grow where God has planted us because you always try to go get new soil. Because you are uncomfortable with people telling you what to do because you're actually uncomfortable with structure. All right. Structure says there are procedures and plans that are put in place for the better of the whole, not for the better of the youth. Boy, y'all are hard this morning. Maybe y'all didn't y'all plan to watch online. That if it only benefits you, it's not for the we. And some of us never grow where God wants us to be because we always are trying to be rebellious in the plan of God because God can't take you to the stage he wants you on until you have accepted the stage that you are on. My best blessing was to have to worship in a hotel for four years because I stopped worshiping uh, facilities and I started worshiping God. That was a tough frustrating stage in my life because every Sunday we would come downstairs or uh, rent the room and we did not know who would be next door to us. Every Sunday, sometimes it was a gap band. Sometimes it was uh, Charlie Wilson. I mean, it was a concert every night. We would have to step over beer bottles to get to church. But that taught me that sometimes God has to strip you of your status so that when he puts you back on the stage, he has you planned for all of the structures that he taught you as you were growing was to help you for when you are now grown in Christ Jesus. You can't get to the 12th grade skipping the 9th grade. Because if you do, when the test for the 12th grader is given, the 12th grade test is built off of your 9th grade, your 10th grade, and your 11th grade. So when you finally get there, you can say, God did all that. It took the rebellion out of me. If you got to be the big dog everywhere, it's actually because you're a small dog. And what, what was happening in the body of Christ is that we use the word lazy, we use the word careless, but what Paul was saying, some of y'all are creating drama in the continuity of the body of Christ because when you come, you always got to put on a show for you instead of exalting God. So what they would do is they would bring more food for them and their families to show that they had something. Okay. What they would do is they would wear their best clothes, their best robes on Sunday to show I'm better than you. And Paul says that you are rebellious, you are frustrating the continuity of the body of Christ because you are rebellious is actually the picture of a soldier who wants to start their own march and not get in line with other soldiers. So what Paul says here, that some of us are lazy and careless. And if you become this in your own personal life, uh, I was telling the 8 o'clock service, my, my parents had rules uh, even up until I was about to get married. I mean, I moved back into the house to while we were building a house, and Daddy's rule was you got to be in by 12 o'clock. I was 22 years old. I was already paying my own house note that, that we were building in Lancaster, my wife and I. But he said, for the six months you stand here until uh, you're going to come in at 12 o'clock or you're going to sleep on the back porch. Because a man of his word, I believed him. So you know what time I would get in? At 11.58 just in case I tripped and had to, uh, you know, my hurt my knee and couldn't get in by 12 o'clock. Because his rules were set. I thought they were silly until I had a child. Uh, guess what? It is very rare, very rare if I'm out past 9 o'clock. Okay, y'all, some of y'all looking crazy at the club, still trying to get it in. I got to be in bed. I mean, I'm not talking about getting ready for bed. I'm talking about pajamas on by 9.30. My onesie got to be all ready. So sometimes we, we, we reject rebellion 
or we become rebellious because you think rules are better, but because you want to do your own thing and become rebellious, now you have to reap the consequences. Okay, maybe, maybe, you're, not, maybe you're not careless. Here, here's what Paul says. He says in verse number 14, he says some of us are lazy. Everybody say lazy. He says some of us are lazy, which is the word rebellious, uh, which is the word of, of not standing in line. But he said not only do we struggle in the body of Christ with people who are lazy, we also struggle with those who are timid. Now, this word timid is an interesting word because this word timid in our original, um, in the original uh, uh, writing would have been the word said, that says that if you're not rebellious, some of you at Thessalonica are quitters. Okay, what, what does it mean to be a quitter? Uh, I know these words look weird when they give us our English words, but uh, the word, the idea for quitter has two-part meaning. First of all, a quitter is one who only theology is to say, I'm suffering because I've done something wrong. Actually, when you look at it, Job spends almost 30, almost 38 chapters trying to find out what sin he had done to go through the suffering he's experiencing. So his three friends come up and show up to help him identify his sins. At the end of the 30 chapters that he goes through, the friends are gone, and it's Job and God alone. You, you missed it. You've had more great days than you've had negative days, but some of us only look at what's wrong. Instead of looking at what God is doing, and in that process, we quit on God because you had one bad day instead of staying with God because he's giving you more good days than bad days. That's why you shouldn't come. All right, all right, all right, all right. Here, here it is, here it is. So not only do you look at the dark side, but in the process of seeing something negative, then you look for a way to Get out. Okay. Okay. Uh, I see people in this room right now who have suffered with cancer three or four times. I've, I see people in this room at uh, 8 o'clock uh, who, who had to go to the trial of their, of their son-in-law who killed their mother, their, their daughter, in front of the children. Right after that, right after that trial, right after that trial, she was diagnosed with terminal cancer. But she's here every Sunday saying, our God is great. Okay, don't, don't, don't miss it. Don't miss it. And then some of us can have a bad hair day and not show up. Some of us can say, my side hurt. And I'm not going to give God his all because why am I hurting? Some people take challenges to build them up. Some people use challenges for a reason to quit. And in our faith, some of us have become habitual quitters because you have bought into the doctrine of that our God is good. Our God is good, but it doesn't mean that our God has to distribute only good things for you to recognize he is good. Really knowing God is good is when all hell breaks loose and you still trust him. When you got more muff than money and you still, because what else would you give up? I heard Rose sing a song not too long ago. It might have been the day that I won't give up on God because he won't give up on us. You know what? Even when you quit God, God did not quit you. So when, now that you've grown older and you've been through enough, why does it, your relationship with God hinges on his good stuff, but you'll show up to work when they mistreated you? 
You'll stay in a jacked up relationship for 30 years talking about I'm going to give him one more chance. He's going to come home tonight. He, he, he's going to bring his mind on and we'll do it for 40 years until somebody dies. But we won't give God four minutes. So sometimes we look for the easy way out in our faith because our faith is not long-suffering. Our faith is not strong. Church attendance is strong where it used to be. But a relationship with Jesus is a byproduct instead of the main product. Okay, don't, don't, don't miss this. Somewhere along the way, you got to build your faith in God. I, 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 we have gone through seven months of turmoil, we, four years of turmoil. Um, the, the America has been going down way before 2016. Every administration, every generation keeps rebelling, which makes God show up even more. Okay, don't, don't miss this. So now we're at a point now that we've gone through seven months of isolation. And some of us have gone through seven months of isolation and you're not any better than you were before you went in. God said, I took you through a seven months class and you ain't learned nothing. It was more than just being at home. That is Jesus Christ who walks with you, talks with you, who wants to be everything for you. But then he says, not only do we deal with those who are timid, here it is. He said, we deal with those who are weak. What is this weak? This weak is those who are weak in the faith. Now, this is the only word that's used in verse number 14 that is used in its original meaning. It is the word that says weak in the faith. What is the weak in the faith? Weak in the faith is not what we believe weak in the faith is. When we say weak in the faith, we say people who have trouble trusting God. In his day, weak in the faith were people who held on to tradition more than held on to the liberty that Christ offered. Okay, let me, let me give it to you. These were individuals who were afraid of liberty because it might drive them further than they had planned to go. Uh, it's, it's people who say all the time, even today, if you do that, how far are you going to plan on going? I'm planning on going as far as God tells me. <laughs> You're, there are always people around us who are stuck at Genesis when you have Proverbs. Okay, let me give it to you another way. You have to be careful checking your spiritual life with people who have spiritually stalled. Okay. Uh, this is a tough one. Have you ever heard somebody say, I can't believe you go over there? <laughs> and will criticize you, will stop meeting for family dinner. Because where you, they will actually prefer you not going anywhere than going to where they can't and won't go because they have spiritually stalled out. Those who were weak in liberty were judgmental for those who are free because freedom is dangerous. Okay. Freedom off of the plantation requires you to work for yourself instead of getting a handout. And the sad part about it is in the body of Christ, the gate is open, but many of us choose to stay in because here, least tradition is more valuable than relationship. Okay, you missed it. I learned way before COVID that I don't have to show up to church to meet God. When I show up to church, it's because I want to be an encourager. And that's not, that's not some of you who are watching online. I love you. I love you. And some can't come out because they've been sick. Uh, they've been exposed to stuff. They have other underlying conditions. But some of us just, back to point number one, got lazy. Okay. Because we go to the mall but can't come to Jesus. Okay. 
But what I'm thankful for, that my liberty taught me what my, tri my, my tradition suffered. When I grew up, you showed up to church to meet the Lord. Come on, Ryan. You at the same church. Uh, you had to show up. The only way you could commune was to have a communion table. Because the communion got holy when it hit that table even though you had 50 hands passing out Holy Communion. That the only way that you had to have these big pulpits because it was some kind of way that the word got cleansed up when it came behind this big wood. That, that it was more tradition than it was relationship. But thanks be to God when I know my God my Savior walks with me and he, he talks with me and he don't wait till Sunday morning just to show up in my life. When church was closed, my relationship was still open. So sometimes it's scary to people who are bound to hang out with people who are free. So what happens to us, Paul says, in the Thessalonica church, in the Dallas church, that sometimes when you stuck at A, you have trouble with people who have already experienced Z. So because I can't be you, and because I'm scared to being ridiculed, I start becoming judgmental of what I can't experience because I can't accept it, so I have to demonize it. Okay, well, Pastor, what they got to do with me? Let me tell you, there are people even demonizing a happy marriage. Okay, y'all don't y'all not gonna have a church with me. It is is people demonizing raising children up the right way? It's people saying that we don't need the Bible anymore because it's dated. There's people saying that you just do whatever you want to do. Just live the life you want and God will be pleased with it. Not only is it a problem in the church, it's also a problem in our world. Amen. That there are some things that liberty can become dangerous of if your liberty ever goes past your truth. Why is it so important? Because Paul says some of you are timid, some of you are lazy, some of you are weak. And he says, but here it is. For those of you who have grown past this, he says, you need to do verse number 15. He says, be careful. No, verse number 14. He says, but be patient with everyone. Okay. If you know, because this whole service, you have sat there and identified people who are in these categories, not you. But if somebody else, it's your wife, it's your husband, it's your children, they should have heard this word. No, the word wasn't for them. It was for He says, so what you got to do, instead of demonizing them, it says in verse number 14, it says, be patient with everyone. Why am I going to be patient with everyone? Because I can't be judgmental with somebody who's stuck at where I used to be stuck. How can you criminalize somebody who's still in the prison you got freed from. All right, all right. How can you try to put people in the cage that God freed you from so that you could feel better? He says, be patient. Why? Because people are at different life experiences. People have had different life situations. People have had different walks. And just because you got there quicker than they got there, doesn't mean your there is better than their start. I'm having church. But I, I learned it like this. I learned it so, so well yesterday. My son uh, started doing cross country, and I use everything for a life illustration for myself. He did cross country so he could have more energy to play basketball. But in the process of him doing, doing cross country, he, learned, he has learned so much about himself. And in fact, I've learned stuff about the scriptures. Because the first race he did, he took off trying to run the speed of seniors. He's on the varsity cross-country team. So he's running with people who are in the 12th grade. Well, they're stronger. They've been doing it longer. So the first race, he almost killed himself trying to keep up. We're on our third race, and this time I noticed he fell back when the race started. And he was running slow. 
And then I caught him about the second mile. And he had passed half of those who had started off. And by the time the race, I caught him at the finish because I ain't going to run with him. I run in between. Y'all not going to have church with me. I, I'm running between the race just to get at key points. But at the end, I noticed he had captured a lot of those individuals who started out faster than him. I said, Blake, what made the difference? Because you ended so strong. He said, I learned how to run. You, you missed your shot. He said, I said, what do you mean you learned how to run? He said, I was trying to keep up with people I couldn't keep up with. He said, so what I had to do was I had to chill in the cut in the back. And they start falling by the wayside. And when they got weak, I got, uh, I got strong. He said, in every mile, I got stronger and stronger until I was able to beat my score because it ain't running against them. It's actually me running against myself. Yeah, y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. So I can't judge others who haven't learned what I learned because they just hadn't had the experience. Woo! But what's so sad about it when God is taking you through the class, but you in the class just as ignorant as you were when you started off. How in the world can you go through sickness, God heals you, and you can't trust him? How in the world can you go through more months than money in some kind of way the light stayed on and you don't trust them? Huh? How in the world? Because you have been left by a spouse and you've had to raise the kids by yourself and now they are prosperous, doing well, citizens, and you can't say, my God is greater, my God. So if he can do it for you, why can't you be patient for him to do it? Okay. Let me give it to you, and I'm going to go. Because he says here, we, we take text out of context because it teaches us, if you take verse by verse, he says in verse number 18, 15, he says, so see, no one, don't waste your time paying back evil for evil. Okay. Don't, don't spend your time trying to get back people who left you in verse number 14. All right, stop wasting your precious moment trying to cut people who cut you. It's, it's a waste of time. It's a waste of energy. I know you want to tell me the story of how they treated you. You took care of Big Mama. And when Big Mama died before, while you were at the cemetery, they were at the house getting all the stuff. And that was 30 years ago. And the reason you don't talk to them now. So you wasted 30 years of sunny days trying to create a storm for somebody else. Okay, boy, y'all not having church with me. Say something online if you don't mind because they don't want to worship. Let me, you wasted your good day, your sunny day, keeping an umbrella over your head to block the sun so that the shade of your dark heart would make darkness for somebody else. He said, don't do evil for evil. They left you in a ditch, Joseph, but Joseph said, I never would have saw Pharaoh if I had spent my whole life trying to get them in the ditch. If God allowed it to happen, it might be for you to grow. So God gave him the shovel so that he could deliver you from what they meant to kill you. Why are you trying to kill them back when God has helped you to grow from it? You're missing. Because he, he says here in verse, stop doing evil for evil. I'm, I'm, I'm about to go to Luke's. Are, are they closed yet? Stop doing evil for evil. He says, and do good to people. Do good to people. Here it is. Here it is. I'm going to let you go because you, you sure don't want to hear the next verse. He says, and always be joyful. I'm, I'm going to talk about this Wednesday morning uh, for Bible class. If you, if you get on Zoom, uh, always be joyful. Never stop praying and be thankful for every circumstance. How, how do I do that, Pastor? For this is God's will for you who belong to Christ. Okay. Pastor, what are you saying? I want joy. Well, let me tell you how to get joy. 
Thank God you've grown past your weak days. Thank God you've grown past your timid days. And thank God you've grown past your lazy days. And for those who participated in trying to keep you weak, timid, and lazy, you pray for them. You do good to everybody. And you're patient with those who are still digging a trap for your next move. You, you missed it. And if you can do that, you can have joy in all things. You can have joy in all circumstances. No, no, Pastor, you don't know. You're talking about, you're talking about that person who divorced me and I got five kids. Yeah. Because guess what? By yourself is better than being with a sixth child. Y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. Being by yourself is better than the inconsistency of what you were with because you were trying to grow up a child. That you can make less now and live in a one-bedroom apartment with one mattress and have peace, unspeakable peace, better than living in a mansion and don't know which way to go because you left God. He's simply saying, let all that go and in all things. Y'all miss your shout. If you let people go, you'll be amazed how much joy you will get. If you let situations go, you'll find out how to have joy in all circumstances. Do you really want to have joy? I said, do you really want to have joy? Well, look over your life and think things over and you'll be surprised how good God has been if you look at where you started from. Paul says, listen, all of us have been stuck. All of us have been in these situations. But be patient with one another. Even be patient with yourself. Even, even be even be patient with yourself. Be, be patient with those around you. Understand that the hardest thing for a parent to do is to remember when they were 15. The hardest thing for a Christian to do is remember when they were unbeliever. The hardest thing for an adult to do is to remember when they were a child. The hardest thing for us to do is to go back to when we used to be, to where God has made us to be. And guess what you can do? Sit on the back porch, turn everything off, turn everybody off, and just say, God, walk me through my life. God, just walk me through my life. And you'll be surprised how good he's been. And then if he walks you through your life, tell him to put some pauses in your story so you can see where other people are, where he has delivered you from. And it'll change your life then you guess what you'll have. When it's raining, you'll have joy. When it's warm outside, you'll have joy. When it's cold outside, you'll have joy. When you're healthy, you'll have joy. When you're sick, you'll have joy. When your kids are doing well, you'll have joy. When your kids are in trouble, you'll have joy. When you got money, you'll have joy. When you're broke as all get out, you'll have joy. When you're employed, you'll have care for us, teach us, check us. And dear God, please do it privately so we can come out stronger publicly that there is nobody like the Lord. Please forgive us of our sins. You are a mighty good Savior. We love you so much. But most of all, thank you for loving us the most. In your son's name we do pray. And all who believe said amen. Stand with us.